Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Channel Industry Association's webinar on Fiber Channel Zoning Basics. I uh, hope you're having a great day wherever you are or whenever you're listening to this, this webinar. Uh, my name is Jay Metz, and I'm going to be your host and MC for today's session. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, some of the, the, the things about zoning basics, uh, for Fiber Channel, which is actually a question that we get uh, quite quite frequently from people who are trying to learn a little bit more about, about Fiber Channel and how it works. Um, I am also the chair of the Education Committee of the Fiber Channel Industry Association and responsible for the credit or the blame, depending upon how you look, for the content of a lot of these sessions. Um, so any kind of uh, questions or, or comments about the upcoming webinars or past webinars, you can you can go ahead and direct them at me. But I would also like to introduce you to two of our stellar uh, presenters today, uh, on, in no particular order. We've got Ed Mazurik, who uh, works for Cisco, and John Rodriguez, who works for Brocade. We've got the, the two back-to-back -back major fiber channel switch vendors going to present, to present to you about fiber channel basics. And uh, they have graciously taken some time out of their days to put together this presentation for your benefit. So I am particularly pleased and grateful for their participation, uh, especially since I know that both of them are very busy. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit um, about my lack of clicking skills. <laughs> no, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the FCIA. Um, the Fiber Channel Industry Association is an organization dedicated to providing uh, information and education about fiber channel technology, the storage networking technology that has become the gold standard of storage networking. Uh, what we do is promote the advancement of, of the fiber channel technologies, and we help turn a lot of the emerging standards that are created by the T11 committee, which is the technical body that creates the standards, uh, into plain English so that people can actually consume them in some sort of, of, of fashion. Um, obviously, what we want to do is we want to create a, uh, a vendor-neutral but also technology-neutral approach to how fiber channel works and how it's a, how it fits into uh, data center activities and, and why people uh, would use the technology and what it's for and how it goes about doing it. So we work very hard to provide these kinds of services to not only the vendors who create the technology, but also you, the end users and consumers of the technology and administrators as well. Uh, to that end, we have been working on a number of presentations that go into some of the specifics and the details of a variety of fiber channel technologies, everything from uh, mainframes and FICON all the way to the new NVMe, uh, NVMe over fabrics uh, technologies, and all points in between. But every once in a while, it helps to come back to the basics and approach the technologies as they actually fit in from the, from the ground. So uh, in, in this kind of uh, 101, 201 slash zoning webinar, we're going to be we're going to be addressing some of the basics. So if you're new to Fiber Channel, we're going to be approaching this from the perspective of uh, kind of a slow start, where we're going to explain what what zoning is, and then we're going to get into some of the real technical stuff a little bit later on. So we hope we have something for everybody. But at that point. I'm just going to go ahead and pass this off to Ed, who's going to go into a lot more further detail about uh, about the presentation. So, Ed, it's all up to you. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. This is Ed Mazurik. Uh, I'm with Cisco and the Cisco TAC, and John and I are going to give this presentation. And this is our basic agenda here. Uh, we're going to go, what is zoning? Uh, why is it needed? We're going to cover a bunch of terminology because it always helps to level set with terminology. Uh, we're going to get uh, John is going to talk about how zoning works and some configuration and activation flows and stuff, which is uh, pretty nice. And then we're going to talk about connecting switches via ISL, which is always uh, somewhat of a trouble spot when you're trying to connect <clears throat> different switches together. And we're going to get into some best practices and some uh, latest advances in zoning. So uh, this is the agenda, and uh, let's get going. So. The first thing I want to say is this is a standards-based presentation, and the standards uh, organization is INCITS, and specifically the T11 fiber channel part of that. And the fiber channel specifications are broken down into different uh, sections, physical interface, framing of uh, signaling, generic services, switch fabric and stuff, various ones, and at their various levels. 
and these are available on the T11 website. And zoning is primarily defined in the GS and SW standards. And material from this presentation has been taken from those two standards. Okay, so what is zoning? Uh, zoning and fiber channel allows specific groups of devices, fiber channel end devices, not switches, but end devices, to communicate with each other securely. It's kind of like a mini VPN in that you're setting up little networks with inside of your fabrics themselves. And when I say little, that's probably not the best term. It's just a subset of the devices. So you define the devices that talk to each other and the devices that don't talk to each other. They care about each other. Uh, like certain targets, which are disk arrays or tape drives or, or things like that, and initiators, which are typically servers. And you will define the groupings of the initiators and the targets and who is allowed to talk with whom. There is some, a concept of a default zone, which I'll get into a little bit later, but it's it's uh, a way of not doing zoning, and it's where dev devices that are not included in zones go into like this uh, repository. But in general, uh, you know, the, the default zone can be permitted or denied, but in general, it should be denied. And we'll, we'll get, we have that reference in a couple other places. The, uh, in each fiber channel switch in the fabric, no matter how many fiber channel switches there are, the fabric zone server controls all of this. It does all of the zoning and does all of the activation of the zone sets and, and that kind of stuff and the distribution across the ISLs. So every switch has a, a, a zone server, a, a fabric zone server built into it. So let's talk about terminology because the, the terminology is a good level set uh, to start out with. That way, when the terms come up later on in the presentation, everyone will, everyone will have it. So a zone set. A zone set is a simple concept. It's just a collection of zones. Uh, uh, and uh, active zone set is the zone set currently enforced by the fabric. And one key point is that there is only one active zone set at a time. There can be multiple zone sets, but only one can be active. Zone. A zone is a container with members representing end devices. And these zones go into zone sets. So uh, the, the end devices go into the zone, and then the zone goes into the zone set. And the uh, end devices are your initiators and your targets of various flavors. So the zone contains members, and a uh, but a member, it really has two contexts, depending upon what you're referring to. In a zone set, a member could be a zone, or it is a zone. And in a zone, a member represents the end devices or group of end devices. And in general, there needs to be two or more members in a zone for really it to do anything, right? You have to have two to tango, as they say. A zone alias is a name which represents an end device. So in, in generally, it, zone members could be something called uh, a, big, a big number, a big eight-digit uh, or eight-byte number called a WWN. But uh, those WWNs are difficult to deal with and hard to, hard to memorize. So you can create a name that represents those. And a zone alias can, can contain one or more of those names. So the default zone, as I already mentioned, contains all of the devices not a member of any zone in the, active, in the active zone set. This group of devices may be permitted to communicate or denied. In general, you want to deny this. You want to make sure that you are doing explicit zoning and you are, you are dictating, you the, the user are dictating which devices are allowed to talk with which other devices. There's two modes in zoning. There's basic and enhanced. Basic zoning mode, uh, zoning changes are done in a, in a specific switch, and then a lock is obtained once the changes are sent to the fabric. It le has a less efficient zone data structure because you have some repeated things. If you have multiple zone sets and you have uh, the same zone and multiple zone sets, and that zone would be actually repeated information in basic mode. 
Uh, enhanced mode, as you are making changes, uh, a fabric-wide lock, when I say fabric, I mean a, a, a lock is obtained on all the switches in the fabric at the same time, and that is obtained, and then you can go in and make changes to your zoning database. That is a good way of preventing two administrators or two users from going in there and making changes at the same time, and one's changes might be lost in basic mode. And it does have a more efficient uh, data structures inside of it in, in that ob certain objects are, uh, are, are referenced and not repeated. But that's kind of transparent and under the covers. Okay, finally, a zoning database. This is a total database containing all the zone sets, zones, SC aliases, and, and, and attributes, which we're not going to talk about very much. But this entire database contains all this information. There is something called an RSCN, a Registered State Change Notification, which we'll talk about. This is a specific message sent by a switch to an end device notifying it that a device is, that it is zoned with has either entered or left the fabric. It's only sent when an end device registers for it. So this is the fiber channel way of notifying a end device when like a zoning change is made what hap how does that end device know that it is now able to talk to another device out in the fabric? An RSCN is generated that tells that end device, hey, you have just been allowed to talk to this new device. And the SCR, just for completeness, is how the end device registers for these state change, these RSCNs, these state change notifications. We don't send anything to devices unless they ask for it. And in this case, the device needs to ask for it as, uh, by issuing an SCR into the switch. And in general, all the end devices that I know uh, do this kind of thing because they want notifications. Okay, this is a graphic that I pretty much stole right out of FCGS, and it shows uh, a kind of a graphical view of, of a zone set and it has three zones in it, Alpha, Baker, and Charlie. In Alpha, there's uh, server A, a disk, a disk one, and a tape one. You can see them kind of on the left. And no one else is really talking to those devices. So that's kind of a zone that is, that is with those devices being unique. The middle one, the Baker, one, the Baker zone, has uh, – a server B in it, a disk three and a tape two, and a disk four. Now, the interesting you can see that there's overlapping between the next the next zone, Charlie, and that's perfectly acceptable. Members can be uh, zone, zone members can be members of multiple zones, and in fact, that's probably the most typical situation. You will see that. Um, in this case, tape two is a member of both Baker and Charlie, and that's that's very typical, and that's uh, something that you're going to see all the time. So this is just a graphical way of, of visualizing your zone, uh, your, your zone set, and the zones that are in it. And inside the switch, the zoning uh, database, the zoning framework, kind of looks like this. There's a hierarchy here between the zone set. Underneath it are all the zones. Remember I said the, the member context in a zone set means a zone. So all of those zone objects are members of the zone set. And under each of the zone objects would be the zone members themselves, and that can be one or more of those. And those zone members can be things like PWWNs, you know, worldwide names of the port, port worldwide names. It can be those aliases, the fiber channel aliases. Uh, it can be several different things that I'll talk about in a minute. But inside the switch, this is how the data, this is how the information is represented. Okay, so inside the zone member types. Inside the zone, you can have multiple members, and these members can be of various types. The, in general, PWWNs or WWPNs, depending upon uh, how you roll here, is a port WW name. It's an it's a inter, intergalactically unique identifier for an end device. And that end device, it's an 8-byte uh, value, and in general, a lot of I would say most zoning is done with these PWWNs. 
uh, but they're not, they're not, they're two bytes bigger than a MAC address, and they're not particularly easy to handle. They're just eight hex bytes of, uh, of information. There, but you can also zone by things like switch and domain ID or sw uh, physical port and interfa or interface, and you can uh, zone by the end port ID, which is otherwise known as the FCID, which is the three byte layer three address that is assigned by the switch. Uh, you can zone by the node WWN, which is kind of a hierarchy higher than the PWWN. But another, the, the other big one is these aliases, zone aliases or SC aliases. Uh, these are just names that you give them, and underneath those names, now you can have m one or more end devices, like uh, specified as WWPNs. Uh, so in general, you want to do your zoning with the WWPN slash PWWN, which is the port WW name, or you want to do it with FC alias or some naming convention because uh, the other ones have significant drawbacks, and like, like FCIDs, for example, might change. And uh, there are – each vendor does allow other types uh, of specific types that might be allowed in different vendors, so there is a provision in the specification to allow – for different types. Okay, so why is zoning needed? Uh, well, we want to provide access control security. So when the administrator goes in and creates zones, he or she is saying that only devices in this zone are allowed to communicate with each other. And because of that, that provides security. And it also provides some isolation you think of the VPN statement at the very beginning. It provides uh, this group of devices are isolated from each other, so there's less device chatter among them. So if you had you know, all your devices in one big zone, which would probably be a disaster, but if you did, then all these devices could communicate with each other, and they could be querying the name server, the fiber channel name server, FCNS, and they could they could draw you know in effect uh, uh, cause the CPU on the switch to be to run really high as it's going through all the different devices that that the switch is indicating that they're allowed to communicate with. Also, as devices enter and leave the fabric, these things called RSCNs are going to be generated, and you want to reduce the scope of who gets the RSCNs. So all these things are controlled by uh, by doing by putting your devices in these zones. So again, if default zone deny is configured, then devices will not be able to communicate without zoning, and that would be what we would recommend. Okay, so there are two different types of zoning, and I, I'm going to use the word type. Um, because we already used the word mode, right? Use basic mode and enhanced mode, but now I'm going to talk about types. There's, what, there's soft zoning and there's hard zoning. And this is this terminology that you'll hear out uh, in the fiber channel world. In soft zoning, the fabric itself, specifically the fiber channel name server, enforces the zoning configuration by, by the responses that it gives the end devices. So as end devices come in and say, basically, who am I allowed to talk to, the fiber channel name server only responds with the subset of devices that are, that, that device is zoned to. So it might, if this one device is in five zones, and, and let's suppose it's an initiator, and it's in five zones, each of those zones are with uh, device, if those five devices are logged in and have uh, fiber channel IDs, FCIDs, then the name server will respond with those five CIDs, and these are the five devices you're allowed to talk to. Hard zoning is actually a programming inside of the switch. You're actually programming access control entries, or ACLs, or ACEs, depending on what you use for the terminology. The device trying to communicate trying to send Some audio problems. Can you can you hear me okay? Uh, 
Monthly. Gotta love live webcast. Uh, oh boy. Um. Can hear you? Is that better? Oh, that's much better. Um, that's okay. Much better. Well, that was my headset, so it, it died or something. It looked like it was okay, but it died. So I can okay, go back to the previous slide. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. My apologies. Uh, okay, well, I'm sorry, to, everyone. My, so let, let's talk about the zoning again, uh, the different types of zoning. There's two kinds of zoning, soft zoning and hard zoning. Soft zoning is the where the fabric, specifically the fiber channel name server, uh, enforces the zones that a, a device is part of by controlling the responses to queries to it. So if an initiator, for example, queries the fiber channel name server, FCNS, and says, who am I allowed to talk to? And if, it's, uh, if, he's, if he's allowed to talk to five targets, then the FCNS will respond with, these are the five devices you are allowed to talk to. Nothing prevents, in, in soft zoning, nothing prevents that device from trying to communicate uh, to other devices, however. In hard zoning, uh, the a fabric actually programs in uh, ACLs, access control lists, or a access control entries that for only those, those five devices that a, a device is allowed to talk to. So even if it tries to go rogue and send uh, frame, fiber channel frames to other devices that it's not allowed to talk to, the switches themselves will drop those frames and prevent that communication. Typically, uh, hard and soft zoning are both in effect at the same time. Okay, so in soft zoning, this is kind of what it looks like. Let's suppose the target one on the left sends this thing called a GPNFTN. A GPNFT is a, one of the fiber channel name server queries. It's a get port name by feature type. And he's saying, I want to know all the guys I'm allowed to talk to that are have registered for the attribute of SCSI Fiber Channel Protocol, FCP. So the FCNS, the Fiber Channel Name Server, receives that GPNFT. He checks the his database, and which is not the zone database. It's his own Fiber Channel Name Server database. And he looks for devices with SCSI FCP attribute. And then he filters that. Step three, he filters that by the members that this target one is allowed to talk to, he's zoned with, and then he returns a response. In this case, the accept to the GPNFT has host one in it and host three in it. Now, why did he have host one and host three? If you look over in the zone set on the right, you'll see that target one is zoned with only host, uh, host one and only host three. He is not zoned with host two and he's not zoned with target two. So that's why the response only has those two in it. Hard zoning, on the other hand, has nothing to do with fiber channel name server. In this case here, we have the same basic zone set on the right, and we have three hosts here. And uh, host one and host three are trying to send a port login, a plogi, into target one. And we can see from the zone, the zone set on the right that both host one and host three are zoned with target one. So the switch permits that and, tr and switches that frame out to target one. However, host two, we're not sure exactly how host two got the FCID for target one, but he could have just he could have just incremented uh, the FCIDs just like an IP address and just added one into, and started sending frames in. But whenever the switch receives that frame going to target one, he drops it because hard zoning is in effect and he has uh, and he has not programmed him. So hard zoning and soft zoning work together to provide total uh, security for devices that are zoned together. Okay, John, over to you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is John Rodriguez. Uh, I do uh, uh, software development for the Brocade Storage Networking Division at uh, Broadcom. Uh, so we've talked about uh, Ed's talked about the what. Let's talk about the how. How does uh, how does zoning work? In this section, we'll talk about the zoning configuration flow and how how does one go about creating a zone set. Then we'll discuss the zone set activation flow. 
Uh, so you've created the zone set. Now what's the process for uh, actually activating it? And finally, we'll talk about the results of zoning. We've activated the zone set. Now what? What happens on the switch as a result? Okay. So uh, typically, a user will start with uh, an empty zone. Uh, follow to uh, go about creating zones, uh, zone set um, uh, to uh, get to get add to the zone database. So, step one, create a zone set, or you can use an existing zone set. But typically, if we're starting with an empty zone uh, zone database, you're going to create a zone set. Uh, step two, create a zone, um, giving it giving it a, a descriptive name. Uh, what I uh, what's not labeled here is that the maximum name size for any zone object, whether that be a zone set, a zone, or an alias, uh, is 64 characters long. Just keep that in mind. Uh, when you're naming the zone objects, uh, step three, you're going to add the members to the zone. Uh, as I talked about, uh, it's typically uh, a port worldwide name uh, member or an alias. Uh, a zone alias, alias to a port world by name member. Uh, and your zone is going to typically have uh, two members, a host and a target. Uh, step four, you're going to add that zone to the zone set. And then the, the zoning and, and programs, the, the uh, ACL entries into the hardware. Uh, and then step six here says, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, you're, if you're in an enhanced mode, then that commit uh, change would be uh, could be implicit. Okay, so now that you've created the zone set, you're going to want to distribute it to all the switches in the fabric. So how does that happen? Well, well, you want to guarantee that all switches operate off the same zone database. And zoning does this by uh, using a standardized commit service protocol to achieve this in four stages. Stage one or phase one is the ACA uh, acquired change authorization request. And this stage basically establishes uh, a fabric wide lock. And it's sent to all switches in the fabric. Step two is the SFC or stage fabric configuration update request phase. Uh, this phase is uh, sent to all the switches in the fabric as well, and it's meant to um, allow the other switches to, to do some validation and consistency checks on the, the zoning pay payload or data that, that is being sent. Uh, step three is the UFC or update fabric configuration request. Uh, this stage is, is basically where the all switches in the fabric will commit the, the zone database to their local storage. And step four is the RCA, or release change authorization request. And this is the fabric, uh, this is where the, the lock gets unlocked, basically. It unlocks the fabric and allows other um, zone updates, uh, zone clients to uh, perform fabric-wide updates. And uh, the, the bottom here mentions that all, all these are SWILS or uh, inner, inner, inner switch frames uh, sent to and from the domain controller, well-known address, and that they are all acknowledged by and accept. So let's step through each phase here. Uh, we'll, first we'll cover an example of a successful fabric-wide activation. So phase one here is the ACA uh, acquired change authorization request. This locks the fabric down, sends all the switches, and uh, if the lock is available for on each on a particular switch, that switch will send an accept to the request. If for some reason that lock is not available, that switch will send a reject. Uh, one reason that a, a lock may not be available is that if the switch is uh, in the middle of an update. Uh, some other update. Uh, in this diagram uh, on, on this page, FC switch one is the managing switch, and, and a user will uh, 
initiates a zone set activation and sends an ACA request to switch switches two and three, and the lock happens to be available on these switches, and they both send an accept. And the result of that is the the lock is activated. In step two, the SFC uh, phase, the stage fabric configuration update request. This is where the zoning data is sent to all the switches. And this gives a chance for all the switches to validate that they can, in fact, commit the data that's being sent to them. Uh, there's so various consistency validation checks are performed. And once they think uh, that they're able to commit the data locally, they'll send an accept. And if for some reason uh, a validation check is fa uh, fails, the are not able to commit that data that was sent. So that, that's illustrated by this figure over here showing that switch one sends an SF, SFC request to switches two and three, and they, they've done the validation and so have sent an accept. Okay, stage three or phase three is the UFC phase, the update fabric configuration request phase. In this phase, the switches uh, will actually do the committing of the zone data to their local storage. And once that commit is complete, they'll send an accept back to the managing switch, switch one in this case. Um, and, and typically, uh, what happens is the, the managing switch or the switch one um, in this case will wait to receive uh, an accept from everyone before it does its commit. In the case of, you know, if someone, one of these switches uh, for some reason has, has a problem, you don't want to uh, do the commit and then have to back it out. Once you get past the SFC phase. Okay, and then stage phase four is the RCA phase. Uh, this is the where the lock fabric lock gets released. Um, if for some reason the ACA or SFC requests uh, are rejected, the uh, the RCA phase will commence. So um, if at any point one of the switches reject a stage, it'll go straight to the RCA phase and do the unlock. And then the figure on the right here, you see switch one sending an RCA request to all the switches and, and then they all accept. And then the result of that is the, uh, the lock is relinquished. Okay, so now we'll step through an example of uh, fail or fail, failing zone set activation uh, example. So for this case, uh, switch one has sent the ACA request and everyone is accepted, so the lock is obtained. But in step two, the SFC phase, switch three here will it has sent a reject here. Uh, for example, the, the zoning data that switch one has sent it may uh, have exceeded the max zone size limits that it supports. Perhaps switch three is a, a lower, uh, a, a down level switch that uh, doesn't have as much memory on it or, or what have you. So in this case, switch three rejects the SFC and then switch one goes to the RCA phase to uh, relinquish the lock. And typically the reject will contain some sort of descriptive error message, so uh, sw the, the, the administrator on, on switch one can then use that to figure out what the, what the issues is and, and make, take some corrective action. Okay, so we've created our zone configuration, we've dis uh, distributed it, and activated it across uh, all switches in the fabric. So what happens now? What are the after effects of applying zoning? So the zone databases are updated, as we just discussed, and the, the, hard, the hard zoning ECL uh, access control lists are updated. And then the RSCNs, or registered state change notifications, are generated to end devices. 
associations are added, then an online RSCN is sent. If associations are removed, the offline RSCN, uh, RSCNs are sent. And once these devices and devices receive the RSCN, it will then uh, query the name server to see what connectivity might have changed for them. And in this example here, uh, a user has created a new zone 3 and are adding connectivity between host 2 and target 2. After adding the new zone to the active zone set, we see here that the RSCNs are sent to uh, host 2 and target 2. And upon receiving these RSCNs, these devices will then query the name server to see what connectivity has changed. Is there someone need to talk to or did a device, did a, did a device go away? So in this case, there is someone new to talk to and the end devices uh, will proceed with their uh, device communication. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to hand it back to Jay just to see if there's any, any questions that uh, may be asked. Uh, no Jay? questions about, uh, about the technical aspects, but there is a good opportunity to remind people or let you know that the slides will be available at fiberchannel.org uh, a couple days after the, the presentation has uh, completed. So you will be able to get the slides and you will be able to peruse them at your own leisure afterwards. So, so I guess we're off to Ed, right? Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jay. So now we're going to talk about connecting switches via ISLs. Uh, John has already talked about when you have a multi-switch environment and a uh, zoning operation is done and activation is done, how that all flows. What happens if you're connecting existing switches together via ISLs? When there are uh, so ISLs, just the level set, are inter-switch links. These are the pathways between different fiber channel switches when you have multi-switch fabrics. When uh, you connect two switches together via ISLs, and things happen that didn't happen before the activation. Hey, Ed, Ed I'm going yeah. to have to stop you for just a quick second. I'm afraid your audio is, is going back underwater. Can uh, you double check it real quick? Hey, yeah, this is my. This is a guess. Oh, dear. Uh, let's try this. Try, try again. Okay. No, this is actually a lot worse. Are you picking up a handset? Yeah. Oh boy. Um. Oh, I'm afraid you're completely inaudible at this point. Um, yeah, so uh, John, would you mind uh, uh, picking up a, a little bit and then we can um, maybe maybe Ed can dial back in? Sure, I'll give it a go. Uh, ISLs are inter switch links and they're um, activated to form multi switch fabrics. So um, when you do these connections between two switches, a merge request is sent to merge the two zoning databases. If the zone databases are the same, then the ISL will come up. If the zone databases are mergeable, then IS the ISL will come up. But for, if for some reason uh, the zone databases are not mergeable, then that ISL will be segmented or isolated, and those two switches will not be allowed to connect. So when you connect these two switches and then the merge uh, exchange happens, there are some consistency checks that are performed. These consistency checks for zoning can involve uh, checks against the default zone, whether it's permit or deny mode, uh, or merge control, um, allow or restrict mode. In restrict mode, zone databases must be exact for the ISL to come up. Uh, if the zone databases uh, in allow mode, if uh, zone databases are mergeable, then the ISL will uh, be allowed to come up as well. 
zones with the same zone name, um, but the similar members, definitions, or attributes, uh, that will uh, typically not be allowed to be to come up. We will result in a zone conflict. Uh, if, if there's any issues with the zone merge, uh, typically some sort of error message will be relayed back to the user. And in this case, the, the user will then check the switch's error logs for, uh, for messages on how to take corrective action. So here we have John, let's, hey, John, let, let me try again here. Is this audible? Okay. Yes. Sounds Much good. better. All right. All right. The wonderful world of IP phones. That's why we don't. That's why we should have phones over fiber channel. That's just an example. Okay, so as John was talking about, the as we're connecting these switches via ISL, this is an example of a successful merge. We have two. Di we have a zone set on the left and a zone set on the right, and they have different contents. The con but the difference in the contents is uh, significant. They are one has a zone one and it has two WWNs in it, and the other one has zone two. So at this point in time, both switches can take that zone set and merge them together, and the, the final result will be the ISL comes up, and the zone set on both sides contains both zones, zone one and zone two. So it seems pretty simple, but uh, when you have different zone names, then the merge typically would be successful. However, if you have a similar situation, but you have the same zone name on each side, but it contains different members, at that point in time, that's going to cause an exception, and the ISL will be isolated. We will not m take those two zones that are the same name and merge their members, because that might result in a communication that's unintended between the different devices. Okay, John, go ahead. Thanks, Ed. Uh, okay, so up to this point, we've talked about what zoning is and how it works and, and how to connect the switches. But now I'm going to dive in a little bit about some zoning best practices. The first one we'll cover here is single initiator, single target zones. Uh, before I describe what these are, uh, let's, let's go over an example of zoning everything together in one zone. And, uh, and discuss why this would be undesirable. So here in this example, you can see that all the, the devices are zoned together in this uh, my zone, this one zone here. And so everyone can talk to everyone. Uh, similar, you can see all the red lines here. Uh, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of noise and chatter going on. You can think of it as a, a conference call or, or uh, where everyone. Um, is a, of these devices as a person, and if everyone decided to talk at the same time, you can just imagine the amount of noise and chatter that'd be going on. So that's, so that's what kind of happens uh, when you zone devices together in one zone, regardless of whether or not they want to talk to each other or not. Uh, so on any zone change, or if a device logs in or out, an RSCN will be sent to any affected devices, and when they receive this RSCN, then they'll, they'll try to query the name server to see what changed, and this results in a lot of unnecessary chatter between the fabric and the devices. Uh, so what are the, the hardware implications of having a lot of members in a zone? Well, here you can see that as the number of entries per zone increases, your number of hardware ACL entries goes up uh, exponentially, as shown in this graph. Uh, so if you have a lot of devices zoned together that don't need to communicate, uh, typically host-to-host -host don't need to uh, communicate to each other, this uses up a lot of unnecessary ACL entries in the hardware. Uh, and, and as we talked about previously, this also results in a, a large amount of unnecessary name server queries. So the best practice here is to zone things together that only care to talk to each other. And typically this involves one initiator or host and one target. And uh, this is the single initiator, single target scheme. Okay. So why do we want to do this? Well, we want to limit the, uh, the zone to the two members, zoning them typically with their world by name or a zone alias, which is typically alias to their 
support worldwide name. We only wanted to limit the zoning to those the two that care to talk to each other. This isolates who can talk to who, so that only the devices that want to talk can talk. And this is represented here in this picture where you can see the, the shaded areas represent a, a separate zone. And the big thing to take away here is that none of the hosts on the left side can talk to each other. So there's no unnecessary ACL programming or no unnecessary uh, uh, RCN or, or NS requerying when, when something changes in the zoning that affects any of these devices. Another uh, best practice is to use zone aliases. Uh, aliases are alternative, alternative uh, names for zone members, and this is useful because it's user-friendly. Administrators can assign a descriptive name to a member or a group of members. It's simpler zone creation uh, because adding devices to multiple zones can be done with one alias instead of manually typing in and adding uh, individual worldwide names repetitively. And it's also useful for uh, device replacement. So if a device needs to be replaced, a single alias can be changed in one place instead of going through and, and scanning through the entire zone da database to uh, swap out uh, a raw worldwide name member. You can just change the alias, and then uh, that should take care of all the other, um, wherever that device happens to be a member of a zone. So in this, uh, this picture over here, you can see an example of an alias. Uh, the, Fourth floor HR servers is, has two members that contains the host one and host two worldwide names. Uh, another example may, uh, that, that's not shown here is a, an administrator could have created an, an alias for, let's say, uh, T1, target one, and called it perhaps storage rack 10. So continuing on with best practices, uh, be consistent uh, with, with zone types. Uh, we strongly suggest customers use a worldwide port name to zone, um, but if you do have to use domain index or some other uh, zone type, member type, be consistent with the zone member types. Either use all worldwide names or all DI, uh, what have you. Use the default zone deny mode. So uh, uh, it says FICON may, may need to use default zone permit. Uh, there are cases when the, the default zone may be needed, um, like in the FICON case, but typically we uh, suggest users all, uh, that customers always use zoning to dictate device connectivity. Uh, the third item here is back up your zone set periodically. In a stable environment, you shouldn't require a lot of zoning mo modifications. Uh, you know, maybe on a new installation, but once everything is stable, you might only need to make zoning changes a few times a week, uh, or if that. Uh, so it's a good idea to back up your zone database every after every zone commit, in case you have to go back to it or you have some record of, of uh, what has changed. Uh, remove zones that are no longer needed. So switches have a finite amount of uh, available zone database memory. Since storage is limited, keep your zone names as concise as possible. Just because you have 64 characters doesn't mean that you need to use it. Uh, so remove zones that are no longer needed. Uh, sorry, if I, if, if I skipped over, keep zones as concise as, po concise as possible. Remove, remove zones that are no longer needed. So uh, for, the, the, I've seen some They've approached the the maximum zone set size, but the the uh, the valid zones only take up a small subset of that, you know, less than a half. And the reason that they have uh, they've almost reached the maximum is because they have a lot of these old zones that are no longer needed. Um, so once you've decommissioned or replaced an old device, remove that zone. And then the last item here is to allow time for zone changes to propagate through the fabric. Um, FC switches are in the FC ecosystem, fiber channel ecosystem is, is very robust, uh, but 
there's no need to, to take a chance to introduce any chance of some un unwanted failure. And in the case of a redundant fabric, which is a typical install strategy, you'll just want to verify that the uh, zoning works uh, on one fabric before you make the change on the other. Okay. Uh, Jay, do we have any questions? I'll take a uh, pause for a quick break right here. Actually, yes. Um, there is one question, and it goes back to the concepts of uh, registered state change notifications. Um, the question, I think this goes to you, John, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the question is, is RSCNs by subscription, or are they required to be received? Uh, you want to go ahead and take that? Sure. Uh, so the devices will will do uh, will actually register for these via the SCR uh, state change registration, and so they are actually requesting to receive these RSCNs. So once you register for it, though, you're going to be receiving RSCN. Well, that's actually the, uh, the 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 pause that I wish to take. I know we're we're starting to come up towards the top of the hour. Um, go ahead and uh, and continue then. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so we've covered the basics. So what type of advances in zoning are there? Well, peer zoning is is a good example of a, a an advance. Peer zoning is good, useful because. Um, Sorry, because it allows a principal device to communicate with. Typically, a uh, principal device is a, uh, a target or storage uh, device, and peer devices here would be host devices or initiators. Peer devices cannot communicate with each other uh, in peer zoning, and the benefits of peer zoning over single initiator, single target zoning is that fewer zones need to be created compared to uh, fewer zones need to be created, uh, which uses less zone database space since one zone can take the place of multiple uh, single initiator zones. And no communication uh, is allowed uh, between peer to peer or principal to principal members, which results in optimal hardware uh, resource utilization because you're, you're not uh, programming unnecessary peer to peer uh, ACL entries or principal to principal. And peer zoning was introduced in SCGS7, which was a few years ago. Uh, let's see. So here's a picture representation of, uh, of peer zoning. Here the principal member is target one, T1. The peer members are all the hosts here on the left side, H1 through H8. Uh, but all these uh, zone devices are zoned together in one peer zone instead of eight separate single initiator, single, single target zones. Uh, there was a, a picture uh, on a few slides back that showed the eight separate zones. So this is one, one zone which takes up less space in the zone database storage. So uh, here again, the connectivity rules. The principal member can communicate with all peer members, so P1 can communicate with all hosts. Uh, we don't have dual multiple principals here, but if we did, those principals uh, devices are not allowed to communicate, and the peer-to-peer -peer communication is not allowed, so none of the hosts are allowed to talk to each other. The advantages are, well, as I already covered, it's easier to configure and manage since it requires fewer zones to be created. Uh, which is a result in a smaller memory footprint uh, compared to single initiator zoning, and also results in more efficient ACL uh, entry compared to uh, uh, a non peer zone. And which, uh, since you're not programming these uh, unnecessary host to host uh, communication uh, ACL entries, then Less than change that affects connectivity to the devices. So, the last part of one thing I just mentioned was that uh, I don't have a slide here, but one application for your zoning is target driven zoning or TZ. 
And target driven dynamics allow the target to basically automate some configuration. Uh, great thing about the, the some configuration steps for a SAN administrator because the storage admin uh, sets everything on the target. Uh, the target can then just go ahead and design what it needs to have a SAN admin get involved. Oh, John, so, uh, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. My uh, I think. I, I have a feeling that the moderator is the only person that actually has a halfway decent signal right now. Um, you're having the same problem that Ed was. I'm beginning to think that this may be a, a bright talk situation. Um, I, uh, I I do apologize. Um, I I'm not really sure what to do about this. Um, uh, that's the last slide I had. I don't know when I started breaking up, but. Uh... Uh, well, let's go ahead and go to the summary, and um, and then we can, you know, we can try. I can try to see if I can help, if necessary. But go ahead with the with the summary, if you would, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you want to cover the summary? Yeah, I can try here. I dial in again for the third time, so we'll see how this goes. I won't make any more comments. I'm on the voiceover fiber channel, but in summary. Yeah, Sony is there to provide security and uh, and restrict devices in certain groups as you see fit, the administrator. The Sony database will be uniform throughout the fabric switches, and that, that's the intent. And when you're doing your zoning, always keep in mind that single initiator and single target zones are really the gold standard here for zoning. They'll utilize your hardware most efficiently and will utilize the uh, CPU resources and the name server in each of the switches most, uh, most efficiently, uh, efficiently. And also your end devices will be the mo uh, more efficient as well as they're not trying to communicate with devices that they really have no business communicating with. There are several other best practices as well that you should follow. Uh, the one about uh, doing your zoning on one fabric A and then verifying that uh, everything is correct with those zoning changes and the fabric is still functioning f uh, properly before then making the, uh, the same changes in fabric B. That's uh, that you have two fabrics for a reason, and, and that's a good reason to use, uh, to have those two fabrics. So do the zoning, take a break. Check things out, then do the uh, the second fabric. So, in summary, that's uh, that's the presentation. It's uh, it was basic in, in most areas, but it did cover some details, and I hope it was helpful. Thank you very much for attending. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, appreciate your attendance. We do apologize profusely for the for the audio issues. We had to suffer through them as well as you did, so we do understand the frustration. Believe me. Um, uh, we're going to be trying to find out how to do this. May include uh, banning IP phones completely. Who knows? Uh, but either way, we do want to thank you for your attendance. We know it's been uh, a little bit difficult at times and appreciate your patience. I do want to thank the speakers for taking the time out of their days to uh, to build the, the presentation and present it to you. Uh, so thank you, Ed, and thank you, John. Really appreciate it. We're going to have a Q&A that is going to be available on fiberchannel.org which will cover all of the questions that were uh, that were asked. Um, we do want to remind you that because of the nature of uh, these presentations, all of our all of our responses are supposed to be technology and vendor neutral. So we're not going to be responding to vendors. Just point you to the specific vendor websites themselves for any kind of questions on the technology that, that they have for proprietary implementation. We're really focusing on the technology itself as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to any kind of particular implementation size. So having said that, we are still going to be able to have um, a number of different answers for you when we when we post the Q&A blog at uh, again fiberchannel.org. And so thank you very much. Please uh, feel free to leave feedback. I will let you know that we do know that there were audio issues. But nevertheless, we do appreciate your feedback. We do take it to heart. And we do work to make these presentations even better moving forward. So at last bit, thank you, John. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. And of course, to the audience, thank you so much for attending. Yep, thanks, Jay. Thanks, thanks everyone. everybody.